from Walgreens. Right about here is the deodorant aisle. <laughs> and uh, if you're relatively new here, we were able to start holding some Sundays in here in uh, Easter. We eventually in July got full occupancy. Obviously, we're not done. We still got to do the soundproofing. We still finished behind this wall. Is a, a, an auditorium for teenagers, another one for students. But we're here. And we're privileged to encourage one another. Go ahead. Right. We're happy to be here. How many of you remember the age of eight? How many of you? A few of you? For some of you, it's a long time ago, wasn't it? Uh, how many of you remember what you wanted to be when you were eight years old? Yeah, like for instance, how many of you wanted to be like a policeman or a fireman? Yeah, how many of you want to be like a doctor or a nurse? How, so, wow, the same hand. People are confused. <laughs> how, how many of you want to be like Barbie or Ken or G.I. Joe? How many of you want to be like a pastor or priest or rabbi or nun? Yeah, nobody. Um, <laughs> we're glad. Well, you know, now here's the question. All of us have to deal with at some age and stage in our lives. As we sit here this morning, how many of you are what you wanted to be when you were eight years old? Yeah, a couple of nuns. Um, <laughs> when I was eight years old, I wanted to be the quarterback to the Miami Dolphins. And that doesn't sound like a great dream today. Back then, the Dolphins used to actually win. And they had a quarterback. His name was Bob Greasy. And he was a Christian. And I read his biography. And I knew that that's what God was going to have me do with my life. Until reality set in. Not a lot of five foot four quarterbacks in the NFL. But my life started taking on a new turn. And when I was 15 years old, I felt like God wanted me involved in music. And I had the privilege of spending a little, about five and a half years in professional Christian music. I can honestly tell you, from the first time I got on that bus to do all that traveling to the last time I got off of it, I was just as enthused from day one as to the final day. And I remember during that time, uh, I was home on a Wednesday night and I was at my local church and I was still finishing college and my pastor said, hey David, would you pick a psalm and read it and one of these two and I want to do some elaborating on it so we'll do some stuff. And I stood in front of our little church that night and I read the psalm and made a comment or two and the pastor took over. And after service, give me an umbrella of grace here because this is a little weird. How many of you have that one relative that's just a little off? Don't point, don't point. <laughs> well, I have a second cousin, and he loved Jesus, but sometimes I just wonder about him, God loves him. And I was standing outside, and he came up to me, and he said, uh, Hey, David, when are you going to start preaching? I said, Oh, I'm not going to preach. I'm a, I'm a singer. I'm in I'm music. He said, No, God told me you're going to be a pastor. Now, I'm thinking this guy's a little bit off. And I know in that instance he's way off his rocker. And I said, oh, Gary, I appreciate the vote of confidence, and, uh, but no, my, my life's in music. He said, I'm just telling you, I was talking to Jesus, and that's what he told me about you. And I argued with him because I never wanted to be a pastor. I, and that people applaud when you say, when you're a pastor, I never wanted to be the um, object of everyone's affection, you know? And... And yet, as I stand here before you, for the last 30 years, that's what I've done with my life. And I've come to a realization in life that every one of us has to come to, and it's this. There are two great days in every person's life. The day you were born, and the day you discover why you were born. The day you were born, the day you discover why you were born. If you want to grab your message notes in the middle of your worship folder, you'll see that uh, we're a 3D kind of church in there. You've got these 3Ds. The way you figure all of that out is you come to an understanding at some age, some stage in your life, where you, where you learn the first D stands for your decisions. That it's your decisions that determine your direction, which then in turn determines your destiny. See, all the decisions you make are all about the choices you make, and life is filled with constant choices. So the decisions are the choices you make. The direction are, is the path that you take. The decisions put you on a pathway. They put you on a trajectory. They send your life in a direction that eventually ends up in a destiny. And by destiny, I don't mean some uh, arbitrary thing that somebody pointed out. Destiny is the sum total of your decisions and your directions. And your destiny is all about what you do 
with your life. Are you still with me? Two of you are good. It's a good morning. That's twice as many as normal. Um, and so it's your decisions that determine your direction that leads to your destiny. And the Bible is full of understanding about how all of that stuff happens. Let me pop this up. Next slide up for me, please. In the New Testament, the Bible's got the Old Testament, the New Testament, kind of like halfway. And a guy named Paul wrote a whole bunch of books that end in Ian's. And in the New Testament, here's what Paul says. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Now that's not 2019, that's like a couple thousand years ago. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. And you're outlined there, underline that last phrase. Understand what the Lord wants you to do. Most people never figure that out. Most people, maybe even some in this room, you're like the kamikaze pilot who flew 17 missions. You know? He was a busy guy. He just never understood what it was he was supposed to do. And folks, that's why Connect Church was founded. That's why Connect Church exists. It is our goal. It is our purpose. To help normal people who go through life and they're just trying to find what that pathway uh, that has all these questions with all these choices looks like. What that pathway when you're trying to, to figure out faith and life and frustrations and hurts and habits and hang-ups. This church exists to be a safe place for real people who have real questions about real life and faith. As a matter of fact, uh, ushers, where are you? We have a gift for everybody in here this morning. We are getting ready to enter into a 10-week series called Why Church. On the front of your worship folder, if you want to look at that, we're going to answer some of those questions over the next 10 weeks. We're going to talk about, you know, why church? In other words, why do we have community? And now what we're going to pass out is we're going to pass these bands out to every one of you, and you can get more on your way out if you want them. On one side it says hashtag by church, and the other side it has our church web address. Just go ahead and start passing those out as you want to. You don't have to wait for me to pray or anything. We're giving gifts. We're going to talk next week about white community. Why do people need community? You want to know what rats and Christians have in common? Come next week. We're going to talk about why uh, we should forgive one another. We're going to talk about uh, what it means to live a life that is full of thanksgiving. We're going to talk about how to live a life of peace and grace. All those things are there on the front of your folder. But here's what I want you to do. We're not one trick ponies. Turn those over, and on the very back, you'll see that we have 10 weeks of grand opening. Part of all of this is what it means to share life and to do life together. You heard Michelle talk about we are a safe place on Halloween night for you to bring your kids and have fun and games and activities and, and trunk or treat and there'll be more candy than any of your teeth can handle, I promise you. And I know I'll probably give out two pieces and take the rest of all fine, just don't tell my wife. <laughs> and there are all these different activities. If you're interested in being baptized, that's coming up. Next Sunday, if you want to know a little bit more about our church, you want to meet some of our leaders, some of our staff, some of our elders. And it's all the way out here to my left or right. We're actually hosting kind of a little reception with some goodies and cookies and coffee and all kinds of stuff. Maybe some of those leftover Dutch us if you don't take them home with you. <laughs> but we have all these things going on. We want to answer those fundamental, foundational questions in every person's life. Why church? Why community? Why forgive? Why be grateful? Why dream? Why have relationships and connect with other people? All of those things we're going to walk through because those are fundamental questions that all of us have to deal with. They're all about the choices that we make, about the things that we do. Now, as you go through life, sometimes you're looking for role models, sometimes you're looking for understanding, and the Bible is full of those. I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about a guy named Moses. Moses was kind of an interesting guy. Uh, he lived during a period of time when Egypt ruled the world, and uh, all the people from his particular ethnicity and lineage were, had been enslaved for like 400 years, and uh, the, every firstborn child was being was taken into slavery and all these different things. And so Moses is born, but his mother didn't want him to 
grow up and possibly be put to death and all this stuff. So she, she kind of was sitting down the river and he was adopted by a guy named Pharaoh who's like the king of Egypt by his daughter, kind of became Pharaoh's grandson, if you will. It's a really interesting story. You can follow along in your worship folder. If you've got your Bible, it's in Hebrews chapter 11. If you've got your flat screen, it's Hebrews chapter 11. But here's what it says. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. And they were not afraid of the king's eating. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That's what I just told you. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Now, if we read that as a cursory reading, it just says a lot of things about faith. And it's in a chapter of the Bible that's kind of known as the Faith Hall of Fame, if you will. And it's an interesting story. But really, when you break it down, there are a lot of parallels between Moses and every one of us in this room. A lot of parallels between Moses and everybody who goes through life. And basically, in this passage, we have life's four greatest questions answered. See, Moses had to learn a lot about himself. Moses had to go through some ups and downs. And it's a really, really interesting question or interesting a conversation that takes place. So in your outline, here are life's four greatest questions. Are you ready? Convince me. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, question number one is the question of identity. And it asks this, who am I? Now, most people go through life struggling with this question. They never really figure out who they are. Or if they figure it out, guess where most people get the understanding of who they are? They answer that question through the eyes or the opinions or the imposed expectations of others upon them. Does that sound about right? A few years ago at a church I was uh, a pastor, uh, we had a kid in our high school group who graduated. He was a pretty outgoing and active kid and he was very active in our high school group. And so over the summer, before he went off to college, we actually had him come back and talk to our high school juniors and seniors about what he learned in high school and all that stuff. The one thing the kid said that I remember is he got up and he was talking to these kids and then he said, but here's the thing I remember most. I spent four years going through high school, worried about what everybody else was thinking about me, only to graduate and realize nobody else was thinking about me. So he asked the question, who am I? Now, Moses answers this question for himself in this verse. He says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, underline the word grown up, and then the next word beside it is the word refused. Underline the word refused. By faith, when he had grown up, Moses refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. See, Moses, like, had it all. But Moses decided that he was going to be who God had designed him to be, not what somebody else had imposed upon him. You know what Moses is really saying? Moses is really saying in 21st century vernacular, just be yourself. You might as well because everybody else is already taken. Right? And, and in doing this, you have to understand, Moses knew that there were some things stacked against him. One of the things I love about the Bible is the Bible never hides the reality that people who maybe show up in, in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews and some other places had to actually overcome things. It wasn't like they were born on third base and thought they hit a triple, right? They had to deal with some of life's difficulties, some of life's impossible situations. And in the process, folks, don't make excuses. Don't make excuses. We do that. We'll say, well, I'm too old, or it's too late, or I don't have anything to offer. 
The Bible is full of people who are overcomers. This is not in your worship folder. It's on the screens only. But take a look at this. If it strikes a chord with you, maybe you want to take a picture. In the New Testament, one of the disciples of Peter. Peter says, I failed too often. Let's just keep running going through these. Job says, I've lost too much. Elijah says, I'm too discouraged. Jonah says, I feel too rejected. Abraham said, I'm way too old. He from having kissed him. He was 99. Uh, Joseph comes from this horribly dysfunctional family background. His brothers got mad at him. sold him into slavery. Timothy was all insecure, worried about everybody else was thinking. Joseph had to deal with all the temptation going on in his life. Elijah said, no, the obstacles are too big. I can't do that. And then Lazarus said, I can't do that. God, I'm too dead, right? <laughs> now, now, here's the deal. Setting Lazarus aside is a special circumstance. Is that acceptable? I mean, you've never been too dead. <laughs> All these other things about insecurity and life's too big, it's too overwhelming, and I'm from a dysfunctional family, and all that stuff. Every single one of those applies to the people we've mentioned, and every single one of those also applies to one man. Guess who? Talk to me. Moses. Every single one of those things we just listed applies to Moses. Moses was born with a stuttering problem. He never overcame his speech impediment. Moses was extremely insecure. Moses was a criminal. In fact, Moses was a murderer. Moses was a coward. He ran from life. He ran from his responsibility. He ran from his obligations and his history and his past. Anybody here have a past? Moses had an amazing past. God didn't even start using Moses. He was like 80 years old. How many of you are these dating? You're not dead, you're not done. I'm going to show you that in just a minute, right? <laughs> Moses had to face these impossible odds, and he had to deal with Pharaoh and Egypt and all that stuff. You want to know something else? Moses never even had a real job. His father-in-law gave him a job. All these things are things going on in Moses' life that Moses had to deal with. Now, how does Moses deal with this? How does Moses I know who he is? Well, at some point in his life, as the Spirit of God worked with him, Moses understood who he was because he began to understand who God made him to be. And he has this kind of encounter with God. And in that encounter, Moses answers the question, who am I? Which then led him to be able to answer the second question that every one of us has to answer. And it's this. Next slide. It's a question of purpose. Purpose says, what am I living for? See, most people will go through life never really understanding their purpose. Never really know what they're living for. Think about it. We run from job to job, from spouse to spouse, from house to house, from position to position, from relationship to relationship. We don't really understand it. And even some people who do begin to understand what their purpose is can't get out of their own way. You know what I'm talking about? It's like the couple who was driving down the highway the other day, and they got pulled over by a state trooper for speeding. The state trooper walks up, and he looks into the window, and there's this elderly gentleman and his elderly wife who are both like in their 80s sitting there. And the officer says, uh, sir, I need to see your driver's license and registration. The man went, no. The police officer said, um, sir, I really need to see your driver's license and registration. The man said, what for? The officer said, um, sir, you, you were doing 65 in a 55 mile an hour zone. No, I wasn't. Well, the officer's trying to be gracious to this elderly gentleman, and he, he wants to be kind, and yet he was doing 65 in a 55 zone. And finally, the officer looks at the car, and he sees that dear sweet little wife sitting over there quietly. And he looks at her, and he kind of leans down, and he says, ma'am, was your husband, or was your husband not speeding? And that dear, sweet little lady looks up and she said, Officer, if there's one thing I've learned after 50 years of marriage to this man, it's this. Never argue with my husband when he's been drinking. <laughs> Come back to me. Now I've got the point. Um, <laughs> If you will give me a pass, because I don't mean to make light of a serious social ill, you understand it, right? When it comes to understand the significance of life, the purpose of life, what we're living for, there are a lot of people who don't understand it. There are a lot of people who can't get out of their own way. And the greatest thing 
any of us can ever do in our lives. My life, your life, this community's life is understand why we were born. Like I told you earlier, two great days, the day you're born and the day you understand why. Now, I also recognize, if you get down to the scripture for me, LJ, here's how Moses did this. Moses, it says, Moses chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value, under that line, greater value, or underline that phrase, greater value. than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. See, it starts out with a very, very powerful word. It says, Moses chose, and then basically skip to the end, Moses chose the greater value. See, all of us have purpose. All of us need to identify that purpose. We don't ever identify that purpose until we answer the question of who we are, right? Once we know who we are, then we can begin to understand what we exist for, what our purpose is. But if we're going to be really, really honest, there are a lot of stumbling blocks. There is a lot of temptation. There are a lot of things that get in our way that cause us to become confused, for us to struggle with understanding, for us to try to wrestle with things. And right here, culture doesn't help us much because culture has its own purposes. And sometimes culture's purposes are conflict with God's purposes. Would you agree? Uh, this, again, this isn't in your notes. But culture basically has three purposes that it kind of throws at us. And here they are. Culture's value system. Culture values prestige. Prestige says, I want to be popular. I want to be famous. Or maybe parenthetically, and, and kind of a 1A, prestige is all about having power in life. Would you agree with that? Culture teaches us that. How many understand culture values that? Here's the second thing culture values. It values pleasure. Culture says, I want to feel good. I want to be happy. I want to have fun. And then there's a third thing that culture places incredible value on, and it's this, possessions. Culture says, I want to make a fortune and be wealthy. I don't know if you saw the news report about a year and a half, two years ago, about the very wealthy man in Malibu, California. He's driving down the PCH, and he's in his brand new, customized Mercedes convertible. When he hits the ground, he goes into a spin. As he goes into the spin, the car throws him out of the convertible with such force that it actually ripped off his arm, up the shoulder. His car goes flying over the cliff. It crashes, and it's burning. The police officers get there for the paramedics, and the police officer rushes up and he like sticks a towel on the guy's shoulder, and all the guy could do is sit there and look over the cliff and start screaming, My Mercedes, my Mercedes, my Mercedes. And the officer says, Man, I can't hold this very long. You're losing a lot of blood. We've got to get you to the hospital. Come on. And the, and the man goes, No, you don't understand. My Mercedes, my Mercedes. Why is your Mercedes so important? My Mercedes is down there, and it has $20,000 worth of options plus the price of the car. My Mercedes, my Mercedes. And the officer says, man, you've lost your arm. i got to get to the hospital. And the guy looks at the stump, and he goes, my Rolex, my Rolex, my Rolex. <laughs> now, when it comes to this type of thing, how... How and where does culture's value system collide with Christ's value system or the value system of the Bible? Culture says we value prestige. The Bible would say that's not what we do. The Bible says we will value purpose over prestige. Does that make sense? Culture says we value pleasure. The Bible says, no, there's nothing wrong with pleasure, but we value people over personal pleasure. Culture says we value possessions. The Bible says there's nothing wrong with having nice things. There's nothing wrong with having possessions, but we value peace over possessions. That we value purpose over prestige. We value people over pleasure. We value peace over possessions. And Moses had to deal with all of this kind of stuff. They're going, come on, David. So he ran away from being Pharaoh's grandson. I mean, it was a long time ago. There wasn't that much money involved. How many of you ever heard of King Tut? 
Now, I don't mean like just because Steve Martin sang it, but like, for real. See, King Tut was actually one of the last of the Egyptian kings. And over in Egypt, because of all the desert, they went to this area where there was like no water, no vegetation, anything. And to this day, there is what's called uh, the Valley of the Tombs. And what the archaeologists had discovered hundreds and hundreds of years ago is that going through and all of these different pharaohs or all these different Egyptian kings uh, were buried in there. They went and they found 61 of the 62 pharaohs. They found their tombs, they found their possessions and all of that stuff, but they never could find number 62. In 1922, as they were going through all 61 of them, they got to the last one and somebody started tapping on something and they realized it didn't sound right. And so what they did is they went through a wall kind of under to number 61 from some big famous king. And there they found to number 62. Tomb number 62 was just kind of hidden away. It was actually a smaller cavern. And the reason it was hidden away is because it had a very small tier, relatively unimportant, but yet still Pharaoh because his dad had been and he inherited it. They found the Pharaoh of a king by the name of Tutankhamun. He was the least significant of all the pharaohs, of all the kings of the entire history of Egypt. And so they just stuck him in a little tomb because back to them, he didn't matter. But as the archaeologists were going through there, the team that was so well sealed, everything was still intact. And there was, there was his crown. By today's dollars, the crown itself is estimated to be somewhere between two and five million dollars in value. There was all this jewelry, there was all this stuff. Here's what they figured out. In today's dollars, all of those extra things found in King Tut's tomb are valued at roughly half a billion dollars. Billion with a B. Everybody say B. B. Okay, billion with a B. Good. Now here's the deal. Using those same analogies, those same metrics, going back to the day when Moses was the uh, grandson of Pharaoh, actually would have inherited the crown, his estate would have been somewhere between one and one and a half billion dollars. Are you still with me? And the Bible says that Moses chose to walk away from it all so that he could pursue the greater value of fulfilling the purposes of God. Now, how was Moses able to do that? Well, he answered the first question, then he answered the second question. Now Moses comes to the point where he actually answers the third question. The third question is this. It's the question of significance. It asks the question, does my life matter? Does my life matter? Is what I'm doing worth living for, worth giving myself to, worth walking away from the family business? We're walking away from a billion and a half dollars in fortune that I can do the things of greater value that God has chosen for me to do. And the Bible talks about this as we look at this story. And it says, by faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. Underlying the words, not fearing. Some of you in this room have lived long enough to know that most of the decisions we make in life are fear-based decisions, right? We make decisions about what we're going to do with our jobs, with our lives, with our family, with our children, with our homes, with our investments, based on our fears, not on our hopes. Based on our insecurities, not on our dreams. Based on what somebody else thinks about it, rather than what our faith says to us. Does that sound about right for many of us? And Moses was able to walk away from that because Moses answered the question about his significance and he chose not to live his life in fear. See, the reality is, in life, most of us set boundaries for ourselves God never intended us to have based on our fears. And that limits what we ever become and living out the significance that God has planted inside each one of us. What most of us in life want when you think about our decisions and our directions and our destiny, what most of us want is for God to give us a roadmap that shows us our destination. 
God's not all that interested in that. God says, I'm not going to give you a roadmap that shows your destination. I'm going to give you a compass so I can share the journey with you. And in these journeys, there are hills and there are valleys. There are high moments and there are low moments. Now, when I think about the fact that, in essence, we launched this church in the Silver Star Theater across the parking lot in January of last year, actually, we were supposed to have this grand opening this week a year ago. Why didn't we? Well, we had some peaks and we had some valleys, and it really does cost twice as much and takes twice as long. My friend Tom Cooper sitting up here, he works and uh, represents the board of the Phoenix Rescue Mission where we go and serve. They're working on their own things, way more expensive than this. And their contractor recently told them, you better get started because Phoenix is the fastest growing city in the United States and commercial real estate costs are going, growing at 10% a month. That means if you were going to spend $10 million last month, you had to spend $11 million this month. You tracking with me? But here's the thing I love. Here's the thing I absolutely love about where we are. If we're going to be honest, folks, we had a dream, we had a vision, but God never gave us a roadmap, did He? He never said, here's where this dollar's coming from, and here's where this help's coming from, and, and uh, this is when you're going to achieve this, and this is when you're going to finish that, and here's when you're going to have your grand opening. God just gave us a compass that led to Alta Mesa, and then He said, let's go on a journey together. Let's see what it's like, as Moses had to do when he led that great movement of people out of Israel. Let's see what it's like to have to spend some time in the land between. Now think about what Moses did in the land between when he led God's people out of slavery after 400 years. It's because Moses understood his significance. It's because Moses never gave into in his spirit that we have in writing these things called the Ten Commandments. It's because Moses was in the land between, had a little time on his hands. We have the first five books of the entire text, the Bible. It's because Moses followed God's significance instead of getting into his fear that we have the stories of great faith, like the parting of the Red Sea and the experience on Mount Sinai and all the things that the people dealt with. It's because of Moses and all that he did that we're sitting here on October 20th, 2019, having a grand opening ceremony for a church that wants to proclaim Jesus is Lord. Moses had his way in between. We had ours. We had been meeting a little tiny storefront over at Greenfield in Maine and trying to put the four group together. We decided there's not enough uh, for us to do around here. We can't impact our community around here. That we, God's going to take us on a journey, which led to an introduction with Kevin Fidlow, who I introduced to you a little bit ago, which led to some of these other folks helping us, at least us sitting here. But along the way, we had more than one speed bump, right? We had financial questions, and we had the people questions, and we had all these questions. But here's the one thing Connect Church never did. We never let fear define our destiny. We let faith and hope. And here's what I want to do. There are a lot of people in this congregation from multiple ages. We are a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-screwed up congregation, right? <laughs> so if you're screwed up, you fit right in. But we never stop believing, right? And here's what I want to do. For all of you who have been a part of Connect Church on this journey, and you gave sacrificially, and you served sacrificially, and you prayed faithfully, and you believed God even when you didn't feel like believing God, but you're sitting here this morning because you were on the land between and did the journey with us, and you made this happen. Would you stand and let us say thank you to you today? Yes, of these folks. There aren't like 2,000 people standing, right? These people, you saw, the, you saw the video. They were the ones who came in and did their own demo. These people gave and helped raise a half a million dollars just for us to be sitting in here. We've not borrowed a single dime. These people continue to pray. They continue to invite. They continue to serve. We continue to reach children. We continue to invest in teenagers. We continue to help the homeless. We continue to serve marriages. 
We continue to serve our community and some of these uh, more sociological needs represented in this community. These are people of faith who took the journey and made it happen. Say thank you to them one last time. Thank you. Without Moses going on the journey and all the stuff that happened, we wouldn't have this book of the Bible. We wouldn't have some of these great stories. Do you know that Jesus himself said that Moses was the greatest man that ever lived? That's saying a lot. Would you agree? And yet God never did one significant thing in Moses' life until after the age of 80. That's good news for a lot of you in here this morning. <laughs> now, Moses did those things. Moses answered the question of identity. Moses answered the question of purpose. Moses answered the question of significance. I told you there was more in there than you were seeing, right? There was one more question Moses had to answer. One more question this congregation had to answer. One more question some of you sitting in here have to answer. And it's this question. It's the question of commitment. Will I play it safe? Here's the scripture that supports that. Give the next slide for me. It says, Moses persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Underline persevered. See, that means Moses had to go through the 40 years out in the desert. Moses had to persevere going and facing down the, basically the king of the world, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. Moses had to face down some of the things he had done in his life, like the fact that he had murdered an Egyptian in the process of all that. Moses had to deal with people who kept telling him, Moses, it's too hard. We're tired and we're hungry. We have to go back. We'd rather be slaves than be free people. Moses had to do, face all of that. And when it comes to the question of commitment, it all begins with an initial decision. You still remember the beginning about decision determines direction which leads you to your destiny? See, it's not like you make a decision in life once and then you don't have to make any decisions. For instance, you might say yes to a job. Or you might say yes to the person who is now your spouse. But it's not like you don't have to keep saying yes and make those decisions. You have to continually be saying yes to your spouse every day because there are all kinds of temptations out there, right? You have to say, yes, I'm going to pay my bills so that you don't get foreclosed on or so that you don't go to jail or go into bankruptcy. You have to say yes to this job or yes to this job. We have to constantly make those decisions every day, every week, every month. We come to the intersection. We come to the crossroads. We come to the fork where we have to make another decision because the choice we make determines which path we're going to take, right? And we say yes to things, and that leads us down this path. We come to another intersection. We come to another fork in the road. We come to another crossroads. We say yes to something else, and that decision leads us in this direction. And ultimately, sitting here today with the sum total of all those decisions that brought direction to where we are. And I'll tell you something else that goes into this process. Sometimes you have, especially when it comes to what I would call super decisions, sometimes you have to say no to say yes. Sometimes you have to say no to good things so that you're free to say yes to best things. Sometimes you have to say no to a job so you can say yes to the job you have. Sometimes you have to say no to uh, sexual and physical temptations because that's another way of saying yes to your spouse, to your fidelity, to your family, to your children. Are you still with me? And you don't make these decisions in a vacuum. You make them with cultural pressure, you make them with financial pressure, you make them with peer pressure, you make them with pride and ego pressures. Life is full of decisions that determine our direction that leads to our destiny. Moses, a leader whose name stands out in the Bible, who Jesus Christ called one of the greatest men to ever live, had to make those kinds of things every day when he had like two million people say, no, let's go back to, to slavery, it's too hard. And Moses said no. I, Moses said no to going back so he continued to say yes to God. And even today, Jim and Willie, you guys know this, pastors and Christian leaders, we're not immune to that. I have to make those decisions as it relates to my fidelity to my marriage, to my wife, to how we spend our money, 
how to pay our mortgage. But to be completely transparent with you, sometimes it's bigger than that. Actually, what I'm about to tell you, less than six people in this room know, and I'm a little nervous to tell you, but I'm going to anyway. We had the Transformation Ministries uh, annual leadership conference this past week, and for the last four or five years, it's been my privilege to serve as the co-host to the MC of that conference. Thursday night, I'm sitting back in the green room. As I'm sitting there, I was kind of doing some bantering. I flashed back to 2018, a year ago, the exact same Thursday night. Sitting in the green room, just myself and one other person at the time. It was about 40 minutes before I was to walk on the stage to introduce the evening session and kick off the evening concert session. I'm sitting there, and my cell phone rings. And I don't recognize the specific number, but I recognize the community it's coming from, and it's a community I only go to periodically to do some speaking, and so against my better judgment, I went ahead and answered the call. It wasn't Amway, that's a good thing. <laughs> and I stepped outside, and uh, the person on the other end introduced himself as the chairman of the board of that church that I had to go and speak at intermittently. It's a great church, a phenomenal pastor, a church of about 2,500 people. And, and, uh, and she said, David, this is. And I said, hey, how are you? And she said, good. She said, you have a minute. And I said, we already have like two minutes. I'm getting ready to go into a conference and kick off the evening session. And she said, well, let me just give this in a nutshell. She said, due to some health concerns, our pastor's retiring. You've been here several times. Our people like you. They love you. Our pastor loves you. And our leaders have been sitting around talking for the last couple of weeks. And well, just to, make, just to call it out, David, uh, we want you to come and be our pastor. Can you be here by Christmas? October of last year. I'm like, well, you don't got to talk to my wife. Guys, whenever you're faced with an important decision, go to your wife and find out what God's saying. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason she's called your personal Holy Spirit. <laughs> and uh, I didn't even have time to call Tammy. I had to like get in there and go through the preparation and run on the stage. Long story short, over the next couple of weeks, Tammy and I talked, Tammy and I prayed. I called about two or three friends of mine whose opinions and have credibility in my life. I exchanged a phone call to with that church. And I was sitting in a staff meeting next door one morning. And I got out of a staff meeting. And I got in my car. And about the time I was pulling on the 202 to the back of my house, I found myself dialing a number for my friend, the pastor. And he answered, and we exchanged some pleasantries, and I said, hey, you know, I've been praying about this, and I know that your church loves me, and I love them, and I love you, and I love your wife. You've done, you've done so much for my career, you've done so much for my life, you've helped me and grown me as a speaker, and a pastor, and a communicator, and a leader, but I can't come to your church. He got real quiet. And he said, how come? No, he said, can I ask why? And I said, yes, that's a fair question. I said, I can't come. And I have to say no to your very gracious and generous invitation. Because down here in Mesa, a group of people who have bought into a vision, they've bought into a dream. We haven't even started demo on a building that was supposed to be done. And I love those people. And those people love me. Those people love me to the point where they have sacrificed, where they gave up the comforts of a little church that was pretty, not very demanding at all. They gave up all that they were doing there because they believed in the dream, they believed in the vision, they had given sacrificially. And I say no to you because I want to say yes to them. You gotta understand, that wasn't easy. I love this man. And I hung up the phone and I just started crying. I was sad. I love that church. I love that man. He needs a ton of me. But as I drove through my tears, I don't know how I made it home. Those tears of sadness began to turn to tears of joy. Because the reality of saying no 
was also the reality of saying yes. Are you still with me? And I saw Ron and Jane Disney's face, and I saw Daryl's face, and I saw Jeff Lynn's face, and I saw Gene Malone's face, and I saw Stephen Sherry's face, and I saw John and Ginger's face, and I saw David and Mary's face, and I saw, I saw Mary Ryan's face, and I saw Susie Roosevelt's face, and I saw Bill's face, and I saw Leona's face. And I saw Kevin and Ken's faces, and many of yours. And the joy that began to hit me by saying no to that was I said yes to you. I said yes to Connect Church. I said yes to Mesa. I said yes to the 85205. And I said yes to taking this church and making Jesus famous around the world. Will I play it safe? That's the question every one of us has to answer. We have to answer all four questions in this conversation that we're having about Moses today. And some of you in this room today, you're confused and you can't answer who you are about your identity, much less get the questions three, two, three, and four. And I want to be just very, very straightforward with you. Being able to honestly and permanently answer those questions always begins by saying yes to Jesus Christ. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads. I want to ask you to trust me. If you're a guest, I promise you this is a safe place and you're about to get your first taste of it. No one's going to embarrass you, come to you, or hurt you, or point you out in any way. If you're here this morning and you have never said yes to Jesus Christ, if you want to say yes to Jesus Christ, today and ask Him to come into your life as your forgiver, your leader, and your Lord, and help you have the wisdom to answer all those questions. Just lift your hand up and back down. That's all you got to do. You're saying yes to Jesus this morning. Yeah. 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 Wow. Father, today is not only the grand opening of Connect Church. Today is the grand opening for about eight or ten hands that went up in the air that said yes to Jesus that opens the grandeur of heaven to them. Today, Lord God, is about your goodness, about your faithfulness, about your love and loving kindness and your grace and your mercy and love, all things we're going to walk through over the next ten weeks when we talk about white church. But God, let me first pause. For those of you who raised your hands, would you just in the privacy of your mind, that's it, repeat after me, dear Lord Jesus, I say yes to you today. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Help me with my hurts. And become my leader, my lover, and my Lord. Jesus, thank you for entering my life today. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. And God, we say thank you. That the grandest thing on this great opening day are the new names written down on heaven's ledger. God, we love you, we worship you, and we honor you. And we give you all praise, adoration, and honor. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen.